Hello there, and welcome back to The Disconnected. I am live with Jay Blake Fischera. We're going to call him Blake tonight. Uh, Blake is the name behind Scored to Death, which you will see in a, the lovely background there, which is uh, hard to answer with what it is, because it's kind of everything at the moment. <laughs> uh, Blake, first of all, thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's the pleasure is all mine with everything that you're working on. But first off, scored to death. What what all does that encompass for everybody? It's uh, well, it started out as books, but it very quickly s became a podcast, and uh, and now I'm I'm trying to make it into a documentary. It is a fascinating subject uh, to to look at some of the names and information behind some of the scores behind scary movies. And uh, Score to Death seems to be all about horror composers. So first off, uh, music, is, is that something that's a big part of your background? Uh, music was always just a passion of mine um, and my family. I mean, my family was, they weren't musicians, but uh, my my dad was very into music, all kinds of music, including film music. And um, that kind of got passed down to my brother and I. And my mom was also very much into music as well. Uh, when people ask me about the film music thing, I always just say that it kind of, you know, there was film music just mixed in with all the other records, you know? like So we just listen. I just listened to especially being my age, being born in the late seventies and growing up in the eighties, you know, I listened to a lot of John Williams and, uh, but we had all kinds of stuff. And when I would visit my, my parents were, were divorced. And when I would go visit my dad, we would, I remember like eating dinner to the uh, chariots of fire score, nice. <laughs> you know, playing in the background. And uh, there's a, a very, a, a legendary story about how what, at a certain age, every time I would get in my dad's car, I would make him put on the Superman score uh <laughs> on the on the tape deck in the car uh but uh but i became a teen teenager i got very into the blues uh Ooh. music and i started playing guitar and uh then when i got out of college and i was living in the new york city area i started gigging a lot um put together a blues band played in various rock bands in new york uh but the blue says the blues thing was mine, you know, it was, it was like Jay Blake and the earthquake. And then it was the Jay Blake blues band that just always kind of stayed constant. Cause I would just shuffle the, the musicians who are behind me. <laughs> that is a very musical name. It, it just kind of fits with that very well. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I, I, I forget the year, but uh, at some point I was, I was uh, inducted into the New York city blues, the New York blues hall of fame. So. Wow. Uh, but I haven't been gigging in several years now, especially with COVID. And I kind of stopped to, to do the second book and then, and then COVID hit. And so like, I haven't played live in a long time, but yeah, music is include music, music and movies have always been huge passions of mine. That so, I mean, yeah, music is in your veins and I completely get that. And funny enough, you, you brought up one title that is uh, kind of stricken into my mind that I was going to bring up tonight. And that is, uh, I grew up uh, playing saxophone and bass clarinet and a handful of, uh, you know, jazz bands and wind ensemble, stuff like that. And to get kids interested, a lot of the times they'll play these random compositions of basically mishmashes of, of score music. And one of the ones that I appreciated the most was Chariots of Fire. It's so <laughs> odd that you mentioned that one specifically, but uh, genuinely it's striking memories of performing that, you know, in our gym in high school and seeing everybody just their eyes light up because first off, super great trumpet line in that song and uh, <laughs> everything that you're shooting out there, it's loud as hell. It's one of those ones where they just say, basically play it as loud as you possibly can. And seeing that and feeling that power resonate with people is always just great to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, music is, you know, magical in general, but there's something about when it's combined with the image, I feel like it imprints itself yeah. like on us in a way that other kinds of music don't. Cause now we've, us, you know, like with just a, just a piece of music, obviously it conveys emotion and we bring, ourselves to it but when it's imprinted onto a movie and especially something 
you know, sports related is always very, right. you know, music is always so important. I mean, Rocky is my favorite movie of all time. And Bill Conti's score for Rocky is, one, is my, you it's know, definitely, one. definitely one of my favorite scores of all time. But there's something about like, like by, in, by connecting it with story and emotion, I don't know. For, I think it gets heightened in, in our psyche in, in a way that, uh, you know, just, just a piece of music alone doesn't. I completely agree, and not to not to minimize it to like a kids movie sort of thing, but uh, one of the things that really kind of solidified the way that I pictured this in my mind for me is the way that Inside Out from Pixar went this whole core memory idea. And when I think about it, there are certain things in my mind that watching a movie and hearing the score associated with that scene specifically, I am zapped back to that one night where I can. And I can picture what I'm wearing with some of these things and literally just hearing that piece from the score can take me there. And it's so it, incredible to feel. Yeah. I mean, I think that they say smell is the sense that I think is most connected to memory, but I think uh, audio son sonically, it has to be as well. I, um, I live in Manhattan and walk, you know, everywhere. I've been working at right. home since COVID, but I used to, there was a period of time where I would walk, home from work when i was working at the at that farthest south as you can get on manhattan and i would walk like 90 minutes home and i would listen to podcasts or like the howard stern show on on sirius and there are now if i sometimes if i walk that route there's parts of the city when i walk that route like i can i remember what i was listening to and it wasn't even music it was just like a podcast i can remember like what was being said like when I'm standing on a certain corner, you know, like, like various awesome. parts of the city, city are connected to like podcast listening and the Howard Stern show in a really weird way for me. And I think it's because <laughs> that connection of, of the, right. the audio, especially the show like that, that makes you laugh all the time. I imagine there's certain things where you go, Oh man, that was fun. And you start cracking yourself up. Yeah. It's like, Oh, That's this great. is where I was when I first, when I listened to that like crazy caller that I called in on the <laughs> yeah. Howard Stern show. <laughs> Um, all right, so score to death. Like, where did that come from to be in the very beginning? Obviously, you started with the books. What made you want to write the the first book there? I, you know, starting in the mid '90s when I started to fall in love with John Carpenter's movies and his music, um, I just started getting into horror movie scores. Um, I mean, I, you know, there was Jaws. You know, it wasn't yeah. like I was completely, uh, you know. I'd never heard horror music before, but John Carpenter was like a big gateway for me. I, heard, I saw In the Mouth of Madness, and the op that opening theme is so rocking. And oh, I was an aspiring yeah. guitar player, and I was way into like Black Sabbath and Metallica at the time, and Pantera. So it's like <laughs> it was like custom made for me. And then I got very into John Carpenter. And then a couple years later, I went I went to college. I went to film school in the late '90s, and I just started to fall in love with the Italian filmmakers like Dario Argento and Lugio Fulci, the Italian uh, filmmakers and the music that went along with those scores, you know, those movies, but Goblin, I just completely fell in love with Goblin and Fabio oh, Fritzi. Yeah. And, you know, I saw Maniac for the first time and uh, Jay Chataway's score for that. I just fell in love with, so I just started to fall in love with this, this style of music, which was at the time, you know, I was listening primarily to like the synth, the smaller synth driven stuff. Um, yeah. And so that just passion just always was there. And I would go through periods of time, like anything, I think we all probably do this where we get very into a, uh, an artist or a style of music. And then yeah. we listen to it hardcore for a long time. And then we start to listen to other stuff. And then a couple, a year or two or something that passes and you get into it again. And it's a waves. And so I would just always go through these goblin waves and Dar and uh, Claudio Simonetti, who was the oh. keyboard player for Goblin in 2000, he came out with a, uh, an album with a band that he created called Daimonia. And it was like a hard uh, prog metal versions so. of, of his stuff. And I fell in love with that. And right around that time, uh, Argento had made Sleep Sleepless and the, and for the, the main members of Goblin reunited to do that score. And so it's just like, it would just come in waves. And then uh, in 2011 or so, a, a, a version of Goblin formed called New Goblin. 
and they released a uh, record overseas that I had to buy and have it imported live in Rome. <laughs> And it just kicked off my love for that music again. It just nice. like, it was this it was the cycle. And so they short, shortly after that they toured here in the states in 2013. Um, it was the new Goblin lineup, but they were touring the United States as quote unquote Goblin. And uh, I saw them live in Brooklyn, and it was a packed house, and it was there was a set of music I never thought I would see. You know, I had been in love with that band at that point, you know, almost 20 years and it didn't yeah. seem like it was ever going to happen. And it just kicked off just nothing but Goblin for a long time. And I wanted to basically I just wanted to know more about them. That's really how it started. And because they were an Italian band, there just wasn't a lot of information here. So I said, I maybe I should try to interview Claudio Simonetti because I would like to talk to him. And that just kind of snowballed into what became scored to death because I was like, well, wow. what can, what am I going to interview him for? And then if I'm going to do this, maybe I should interview other people. And then, so, I mean, that's, that's a long way to get it. So I'll, I'll cut that. I'll cut that. <laughs> I won't drag that story on much longer. <laughs> no, it's but fascinating. Was, but that was really it. I, I, it was just, I wanted to know more and the information I wanted to know wasn't available. And I started to read other film music related books and other film music uh, interview books, even ones with composers I wanted to talk to like Chris Young and the information that was in them was great, but it wasn't what I wanted to know. So um, I just decided to reach out to them and see if they would let me interview them. I had written, I was at that point I had been writing for a blues website, a weekly column and I'd interviewed some great musicians, some of my guitar heroes like Steve Cropper and uh, Leslie West. And um, I was trying to do freelance things for horror movie websites. Like I had interviewed Bruce Campbell, who, you know, I love. And so it wasn't like out of the blue. I was like, I'm just going to interview these people. Like I'd already <laughs> kind of been dipping my toe in that pool. Right. Um, so I did it. And uh, I really thought that not a lot of them would say yes. And I wasn't sure I was the right guy to do the job. So I figured I would interview like two of them and see if I thought they were good. Not that the composers were good, but whether I was good at interviewing right. film music <laughs> composers. And I said, and I figured, you know, the, the, I can get those on a, a horror movie website. Um, you know, I could edit them down and they can live on surely somewhere. They're not going to go to waste, but maybe I'm not the right guy to write a book about this. Thinking that most composers would say no, I reached out to like seven, eight, something like that. And they all said yes. And I was like, oh, okay. So I I guess I'm doing Shit, I have to now. do more work now. <laughs> so I was just like, I guess I'm going to do it. So uh, that was like late 2013. And I think January of 2014 is when I, I did the first couple of interviews, which were Harry Manfredini who did uh, his best known for Friday the 13th and Alan Howarth, who was best known for his collaborations with John Carpenter. And uh, so kind of the journey started late 2013 and then with the research and all that. And then by 2014, I was kind of on my way and I did that. I interviewed people for, I don't know, two years, a year and a half or something. Uh, and uh, the book came out in uh summer of 2016, which was when John Carpenter toured. Uh, and uh, my book and the book came out in early July. I saw John Carpenter play like a week later here wow. in the city. And uh, I found it incredibly moving. I mean, the guy changed my life. And when he played in the mouth of badness live, I literally cried because I, it was, it was this weird, like full circle thing. Like I just had this right. book come out and I had never had anything published like that before. And I felt this tremendous amount of accomplishment and I was very proud of it. And then I was seeing him and it was just, it was all connected. All the emotions kind of came out and I, it was like that. And then it was like that night I decided I wanted to do it. I, my work wasn't done. I wanted to do another one. So it was like two concerts that really, uh, kind of sparked both books were kind of inspired by two That's live awesome. concerts of film music so 
Wow. I, I mean, the, the the hard part here is there's like 19 things I want to respond to. But <laughs> first, uh, shared passion. I am very, very fortunate and super glad that they're doing it again. I get to go see Goblin in 10 days here in Kansas City. They're doing the, the Suspiria play along. And I... I wanted to do that the last two or three times that they did it. And we, our kids were too young, so I couldn't make it out there, but oh my gosh, I am like vibrating with excitement for this thing. So I, I just can't wait. Um, the next thing, John Carpenter, hugely formative for me, hugely formative. Uh, in the mouth of madness is not one that a lot of people grab onto for some reason. Cause first off the film, it's a little, it's a little weird compared to a lot of the other more accessible mainstream John Carpenter things. Uh, yeah. Do you feel the same way about the film as you do, obviously, about the score? Yeah, because, I mean, they're kind of connected. You know, it was oh, very much. It was. Uh, when I saw that movie, I. Uh, my friends and I were very into making movies with like my VHS nice. camera. And, you know, we were teenagers in the 90s. So it was a lot of like teenage boys trying to be quentin tarantino you know <laughs> right <laughs> and uh i think it was my birthday of probably 94 95 whenever that year whenever that came out on video and i my a bunch of my friends slept over and uh we watched that movie and then we made our first horror movie that night with nice. like the end credits just playing in the background as the music <laughs> behind us because it was vhs you know we didn't right. have you know, you had a family computer and you had to dial up if you were going to go on the internet, if you were lucky, right. if you had that. So it wasn't like we were editing, you know, it wasn't like it is now. We did everything in camera. And uh, so that, mo that movie made a huge impact on me, the music, the movie. And then when I started to kind of research, which again was different because I wasn't, you know, the internet wasn't what it is now. Um, right. John Carpenter. I was like, who made this movie? Who did the soundtrack? I went out and I bought the, the soundtrack on CD. And uh, I realized that John Carpenter had been dire had directed so many movies that were so important to me my entire life. Like right. uh, everything from, you know, Big Trouble in Little China and then Escape from New York. And they Live even at that point. And um, Prince of Darkness. My friends and I had watched that. And you know, also all these movies, the thing, Christine, I had a very weird memories of even Starman. I remembered renting with my dad and my stepmom and my brother. Nice. So I just realized, oh, my God, this guy has been one of my favorite filmmakers my whole life. And I didn't even know it. Um, and so... how fortunate that it was the director <laughs> and the composer and it was the same person. Yeah. And so it just, uh, yeah, I love that movie. You know, do I think it's his best movie? Probably not, but it'll always have a special place in my heart. And, um, yeah. and I think it's great. I think it's great. I mean, there are, you know, there's certain things that maybe don't work about it as well as they, you know, it has been aged as well as they were then. I would but, agree with that. But uh, ultimately, I think, I think it's, I think it's a great movie. I love that movie. One of our uh, local theaters does a Carpenter Fest every year, and they throw they show uh, three films back to back. And my wife, uh, before she had met me, had not seen most of Carpenter stuff. She's seen like The Thing and Halloween. I think Th those are the mainstays, of course. And uh, I took her to this first Carpenter Fest with me, and they started with Assault on Precinct Thirteen, followed that up with Prince of Darkness, and both of them, she was like, "Man, those were those were pretty good." And they ended the night within the mouth of madness and at the end she was just like you could see like her face blown back a little bit like what was that i uh, yeah i i love ending a night with that movie it is such a compelling piece especially when compared to the rest of his filmography they uh right around the time that he was touring or the album his first album came out or something i guess it was before the tour it was when the albums had come out at the uh brooklyn academy of music has a in a big theater you know a movie a cinema program Right. In theaters. And they did a huge, all, they'll do like a month where they play every movie by an artist, by a filmmaker. Wow. And they did a John Carpenter thing where they played every one of his movies. And um, I live in Manhattan. I don't live in Brooklyn. And so, uh, you know, people in Manhattan are notoriously lazy when it comes to leaving Manhattan. <laughs> but <laughs> I was like, I have to, I have to go to Brooklyn 
but I can't go for every single movie. So I had to be very right. strategic about what I would go see. And some of it had to do with things like that, you know, I didn't go see the thing one because I knew it would be packed, but two, I have already seen it screened a few times, right. you know, like I'm in theaters. And, and you know, it'll come back. Yeah. And with Prince, you know, Halloween I've seen in the theaters, but the movies I chose, I so went to go see in the mouth of madness, Prince of darkness and Starman. Those were the three. I, I can't imagine I Starman on the big screen. <laughs> and uh, Amazing. yeah, it was, it was magic. We could obviously turn this into Carpenter talk for the next two hours. However, <laughs> uh, the last thing I really wanted to grab onto is it really resonated with me why you started what you started, because a lot of why I do what I do nowadays is for a lot of the same reasons as one is a lot of people were giving just straight bad information out there on physical media and movies. And the other one is it wasn't what I wanted to hear. And so nowadays I'm interviewing people that I'm finding passionate and, and with things that I enjoy and that leads to you. I mean, this is this is kind of like tailor made for all of my interests. And I think I've said that like four or five times now. But my <laughs> God, it is it is so perfect. And I don't understand how I didn't hear about this previously. But now I just can't wait to get these books in as a part of this uh, campaign that you're running right now. And so you're trying to do a documentary. I'm going to share the screen here. This is what we have at the moment. This is Sunday night, the 16th. We got 16 days ago. Uh, exactly 99 backers at the moment. I, I'm so excited that somebody might see this and be the hundredth one to take you over that <laughs> edge. Um, what what is going to be in this documentary that is not in the book so far? Well, the book for the people that don't know the books, the books are collections of in depth interviews with composers, and it's a between the two books, it's a total of thirty composers, and wow. um, you know some of them span from. I don't know, nine, 10 pages to, you know, 30 pages, you know, like I interviewed for the wow. second book, my interview with Charlie Clouser, who's best known for the Saul movies. We, t we, he and I chatted for like four and a half hours. Um, but yet in the second book, I also interviewed two Japanese composers, um, uh, Koji Endo and uh, man, I, I'm going to look bad here. <laughs> uh I, but there was a language barrier and I couldn't, right. um, we had to exchange email. So their, uh, interviews ended up being much shorter, you know? So it's a, it's a weird collection of, um, lengths and the things we talk about, but in the, for the most part, it's, um, the books, they're a lot about the process of scoring movies, uh, and, kind of biographies of them and their careers and, and their processes. I didn't want to, I don't want the movie to be an abridged version of the books. Right. Because, you know, what's the point? The books exist. I can't do, I can't give all the information that I have in the books. So what I really want to do with the movie is to explore how horror how music works in horror movies in ways that I wasn't be able to explore in the books. So I have a, so a few videos uh, uh, floating around on social media and stuff right now where we get to see um, like Harry Manfredini talking about the kid, 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 my, my, my. and he talks about the, he talks about it in the book obviously but it's I think it's right. different to see it in action with the movie clips. I have right. Charlie Clouser from saw talking about the, the hello Zep theme. And um, like, again, he talks about it in the books, but it's a whole different experience. And I think it's, it's a way of exploring it in a way that I wasn't able to. And we, you know, I have a whole thing about Bernard Herman and, and psycho was a video that I cut for this. And um, that's doing a, uh, you know, because the more of the history of, of horror film music is also going to be a part of it. So that's kind of really what I want to do. It's basically what I'm excited about in the movie is that we're, um, I get to kind of continue exploring this film music, this craft that I've, I've come to love and I've spent like the last decade now kind of studying, but I get to explore it in ways that I haven't been able to yet. So that's kind of what's exciting about it. And it's going to be, you know, obviously background about some of the most famous themes and scores in horror history, but it's also going to be 
it's going to be that stuff, but it's going to be in relation as to how it works in horror. Because I think some people wouldn't agree with this, but I think music has a unique relationship in horror movies compared to other kinds of movies. And so it's kind of going to be about like, in a way, I guess maybe that's a thesis statement of the film. And we're going to explore like why it's different, how it works, what music does in horror movies. Cause there's a million things it does from adding weight and gravitas to a slasher movie like oh, yeah. Richard Band's score for uh, House and Sorority Row, which is this lush orchestral score for an 80s slasher movie to, you know, uh, everything from, you know, Harry your Manfredini and Jaws, how the score kind of becomes the killer when the killer is not on the screen yeah. and, you know, how this the jump scares work and timing and all those things. And so we've already interviewed five composers for it. Um, the great thing about doing the books is that I've wouldn't have imagined in my wildest year in my wildest imagination, but that I've, I've become fr kind of friendly with a bunch of these guys and girls now. So I called on, I called in some favors from my, from the friends. And so we nice. interviewed Charles Bernstein and Harry Manfredini, Richard Band, uh, Charlie Clouser and Holly Amber Church so far. Uh, because I wanted to have material to show when the Kickstarter went up. I wanted to have be able to show a video and I wanted to be able to put videos on social media to show like what is it we're trying to do with this. And uh, with the money, depending on how much money we can raise, that's going to be kind of determined like how many more people can we put in it. And um, or at this point, if we could really make it at all. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You well, know, let this be the lightning rod then. I, I understand uh, not being extremely optimistic. However, I do hope that a lot of people can band together because this is the sort of thing that it really is exciting to get an answer to things like that. And to me, uh, in, in just a few minutes, I'm sure we're going to bring up physical media and what you've enjoyed with it. But for me, a lot of the reason I buy these, these movies and Blu-rays and even like vinyl records uh, to have on hand for me to experience them is it, it gives this context that streaming will never be able to do. And with something like this documentary, it gives not only the context behind some of our you know most famous and beloved scenes of all time, but it gives context to where those scenes came from in history and how it can genuinely affect a, like a generation in ways that we can't really prepare for. And it's not like when they wrote Jaws that they were saying, no, when people hear these two low notes for the rest of their life, they're always going to picture a great white. Like, that's not something you can plan for. Yeah. It's like nowadays trying to make a TikTok and say, I'm going viral. That's that's not how this works. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, yeah. not to put you on the spot, but there are there certain contextual pieces of music that really inspire this that are maybe less thought of? Like, obviously, Hello Zep is a big one that's a lot more modern. The Jaws theme is huge. But uh, then we got stuff like Jurassic Park or the, the you know, Indiana Jones themes. Are, are there other ones perhaps rooted in horror that you say, you know, this does not get enough attention and people really need to pay attention to how much it had an actual cultural impact? Uh, I mean, cultural impact, like, you know, the Halloween score, Jaws, Friday the 13th, Psycho, um, you know, all those things are, you know, huge. I mean, yeah. they're... Jaws, Psycho. I mean, can you think of more? If you if you were to like think about the pieces of music that have been used in other movies the most, whether it's parody or not, Jaws, right. Psycho are among the top. Uh, Good, Bad, the Ugly, Bad to the Bone. You know, <laughs> you That's know, true. like you know, like the those are like the big four, and two of them happen to be you know horror horror movie, uh, right? Sp a bad to the bone was in Christine. So in a weird way, that also is a horror movie cue. Um, it's just, you know, through doing the books, I just realized kind of how unique, I mean, film music is in general, but how unique it is in horror movies. And, uh, and that's what really kind of drove me. It was like talking to all these composers is what inspired the idea really to, right to continue to, to, to continue to uh, interview composers, but to like, okay, like I, the way Charlie Clouser talks about the hello Zep theme um, and you know, the interview that I have 
online right now from my interview for the movie is very short. And I think you, you can get a te- you can get a feel for it, but the way he talks about it and how why he did the things he did are fascinating. You know, like you know, it, it comes at the end of the movie when you're get, when the viewer is being bombarded with all this information. You're seeing yeah. all the things from the during the movie that you didn't see and all this stuff. So he, the way he talks about it is he had to keep it really simple because it couldn't be distracting. Like the, it had to be easy for the brain to decode. Right. So that it wouldn't interfere with all the information that it's, that, that, that the brain is getting through, through the visuals and contextually in the movie. Um, and it's just stuff that like, I never would have thought about that, but you know, stuff that these guys <laughs> right. think about it. And I find it fascinating to hear them talk about it. Um, and my hope is that other people will too, because look, you know, horror genre has a, you know, has a huge and passionate fan base and film music has a huge and passionate fan base and horror film music fans may be a subsect of both of those <laughs> things, but they're like really passionate and, um, and, you know, and I want to do something for them. You know, my hope is that, in the remainder two weeks, the last two weeks of the campaign, like we'll, we'll start to get some traction because I think it's, uh, I think, I think it's a good, I, I think the information that I've heard so far for the movie, you know, the, in the interviews I've already done, I think is really great. And that's not because of me, it's because of, <laughs> you know, these amazing artists. And that, that right. was always my intent for the books too. When I started doing the books, I never felt that they were my books. You know, there was always, they were my books and they were the composer's books because it was their stories and it was their generosity and their time. Um, You know, they were, they're much more a a part of the books than I am. And, uh, and I think they're people that kind of deserve more credit than they get. And, the f- I think of the film that way too. Like this is, it's my, yes, like I'm making the movie, but it's really the composer's movie, you know, and um, to help them tell their stories and, and to kind of shed some light on this craft, this art form that I think is endlessly fascinating. I mean, like I said, I've already spent like 10 years talking to composers and, and I haven't gotten <laughs> tired of it yet. That's how, you know, how interesting it is. Like I just keep on talking to more people and, and it's just, it's, it's been amazing. I mean, it's changed my life and um I really would love to to make this movie and uh, the idea of the raising the funds and the hope is that uh, ultimately we'll raise funds to not just make the movie, but make a movie that can reach the potential for for what's there. So, you know, that's that's kind of where we're at now. Well, that's that's the thing. Even uh, you know, it's just as someone who's discovered everything related to Score to Death in the last three weeks or so. I you can tell reading through your copy, the uh, reviews for the books, the information that's already out there based on the podcast, all of it. The passion just kind of oozes out of it, and it's something that you can tell it's somebody that genuinely cares. Which a lot of times that's not hard to decipher. And with this, it's, it's very obvious that you're just all in on it. And it's so appreciative because one of the things you said just a moment ago is really true in this sector specifically. And that's how underappreciated some of these people are. Um, you've mentioned some of the bigger names. Uh, I'm just curious, just based on your own personal relation to everything, are there other composers that you would like to highlight right now that are perhaps like vastly underappreciated that you think uh, probably deserve to be up here closer to the, you know, Mount Rushmore of horror scores. Well, I mean, there's big people that I don't think are known. They're not considered horror movie composers, but like Jerry right. Goldsmith has done some of the greatest horror scores of all time. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, just happens to be also one of the, the you know, one of the, yep. on the Mount Rushmore of horror movie, of, of film score in general. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, obviously interviewing 30 of them for the pod, for the movies and then interviewing some more for Score to Death, the podcast. It's really been fascinating. And um, like, I love Jay Chataway's stuff. I mean, the, the, especially the first book was really just like, who do I love? You know, like, whose music right. do I love? Who do I want to talk to? And um, 
Jay Chataway, you know, he's most known to he's known to most people for scoring Star Trek television, like the next generation and Voyager and stuff like that. But for horror movie fans, he did Maniac, he did Maniac Cop, he did Silver Bullet, which was one of my favorite movies of all time. Nice. So um, it was really important to me, uh, for me to interview him in the first book. And he's one that I don't think a lot of people talk about much. Uh, I agree. John, John Harrison, who's in the second book, he hasn't really, he didn't do a whole lot because he became a director. But he he did Creep Show and Day of the Dead for George Romero. And um his interview is great because he is a director. So we talk about some of that. We talk about George Romero. A lot. I mean, that's the other thing is right before the first book, I made that right while I was doing the first book, Wes Craven died. Mm. And then while I was doing the second book, George Romero died. And so it was also kind of amazing to be able to talk to these composers about these great right filmmakers that we lost you know the first the book is ha yeah. has the and they both have dedications to those filmmakers and at the beginning of the books but to be able to talk to uh Char charles bernstein and harry banfordini about Wes craven in the first book and then after he had passed and then being able to talk to donald rubenstein and and john harrison in the second book about george romero after george romero passed i mean it was a big deal because wow. uh it's also, it's also the books also shine a lot of light on the filmmakers that they're working with and the, and the relationship between a director and, and the, and the, and the composers and stuff. The other person that I would highlight who's in the second book is I had the extreme honor of being able to interview uh, Robert Cobert, who probably doesn't, most people don't really know who he is now, but he wrote all the music for the dark shadows television right. series and um he wrote the music for the original tv movies for kolchak uh before it became the, the tv series kolchak the night stalker yeah um he did trilogy of terror he was like 94 when i interviewed him and um <laughs> wow. and it was a <laughs> highlight of my life to talk to him for <laughs> two hours and we had the most fun time he was you're still sharp as a tag and mouth of a sailor. And um, <laughs> he enjoyed busting my balls while during the interview. And we just had the most fun time and taking him, walking him like down memory lane and talking to, you know, he's telling me stories about being like a teenager and playing in a jazz band and the cat skills for the summer and <laughs> trying to get laid. And uh, it was just the most fun experience. And unfortunately uh, he died at like 96 uh, in early 2020 before the book came out. So uh -oh. um, that's been like, that's been, you know, that it's been great to be able to talk to some of these people and you have to highlight right. guys like that, who at this point, not a lot of people think about or, or know about, but um, to be able to tell his story was kind of very um, special to me. That's awesome. Uh, what about a, a horror composer that had passed before you started on this project that you would just be spouting off questions left and right because you'd be so oh, excited? I mean, Jerry Goldsmith, uh, okay. Bernard, Bernard Herrmann, um, you know, any of the, the greats, you know, there's right. so many. I was that. I mean, that's the unfortunate thing is getting to it kind of so late that we, we missed so many. Um that, uh, but that's something I, that's been kind of interesting to do with the movie, which I didn't do a whole lot of with the book. A lot of composers brought up Bernard Herrmann in the books, mm. kind of just on their own merit. But to sit down with composers now on camera and say, like, why does Bernard Herrmann come up so much? And to talk about them specifically or, you know, because I also with the movie, I want to highlight some of the great scores of all time. So to be able to talk to these composers about like the Omen score by Jerry Goldsmith yes. and get their take on Jerry Goldsmith because film composers love Jerry Goldsmith. You know, they all, I haven't found one yet that doesn't like idolize him. So um, to be able to highlight some of these scores that I didn't get to highlight in the book because the chapters were mostly really about the person I was interviewing. But now that the movie is something kind of totally different, you get to highlight scores uh, right. a little bit more. So I, you know, I don't know. So there's, there's ton, there's ton. And there's, there's ton that are still alive that I, I would love to interview that I haven't gotten to interview yet. So 
Well, hopefully there's a score to death nine through 17 in the, in the future <laughs> at some point. Let's I, get the, uh, we'll get the movie done first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when-